My name is Sadie Scott. I'm currently the Vice President of Veterinary Services here at Wayside Waves for 10 or 11 more days, and then I'm going to go back to private practice. So, um, sorry if that's news for some of you. Yeah. No? No. It's fine. Um, what's that? It's fine. It's, it's <laughs> not. It's <laughs> uh, but I, I created this lecture, uh, I don't know, a month or two ago to, to give to staff, and so many volunteers were unable to make it. We talked about doing it on the weekend so that um, so that you guys can have this information too. Heartworm disease to me is fascinating. I mean, I just absolutely love it. Any opportunity that I get, I go to lectures about heartworm disease. You know, um, we think that we, we have all the answers and truly we don't. Every year when I'm attending heartworm lectures, I learn more science. So they're still doing science on it. We're still discovering things about it. Um, there's still things that we're doing and we don't know why, but they work, so we're doing them. So. Um, the thing that I think is really surprising for most people is this is an incredibly complicated disease. So we think we, you know, we tell our doctors they have heartworm disease and we give them a, a few things to, to watch for, but actually the disease is incredibly complicated. Feel free to ask me any questions as we go through it. It's taken me a lot of years to wrap my brain around it, and let me be honest with you, most veterinarians do not understand heartworm disease, okay? So feel free to interrupt me, I really, I don't mind. Um, in this lecture, we're going to talk about prevalence, transmission, development, treatment, and management. And this picture here just shows that um, there's a mosquito on that kitty's nose. And then that picture shows end-stage heartworm disease. This dog is very close to death. Did not survive this disease. I don't know this dog. I pulled it off the internet. Um, but this dog, I'm sure, confident succumbed to the disease. Okay? Um, it is a lethal de disease without treatment. Um, Any questions about that? Oh, I guess I need to give kudos to Google. My lecture is um, is compliments of Google Pics. Okay, so no words, just pictures. I'll say all the words. Okay. So prevalence. This is an incident survey map. This was done by the American Heartworm Society. The American Heartworm Society was developed in 1974 by a group of veterinarians that wanted to start tracking data about heartworm disease. What they do is they have a triennial symposium every three years they meet and they gather data. What they're doing is they're sending out census to veterinary clinics to gather data. The last census that was sent out, about 4,500 veterinary clinics and shelters participated in that information. Okay? So what this does, this particular picture is showing us the growth of heartworm disease from 2001. Okay? And can you just tell from 2001 to 2016 how, how much the disease is actually spreading? Okay. Also note that in 2001, we have a lot of white space. White means no disease. And in 2016, that's closing in. Okay. Keep in mind, one of the reasons why this is happening is because of shelters transferring animals. Okay. The weather up here does not support the transmission of heartworm disease, and we'll talk about it later on in this lecture. What we're doing, because we're expanding our transfer partners, because there's a supply and demand in certain parts of the country where uh, in the Northwest there's not enough cats. So we're shipping cats up to the Northwest, so the shelters have cats to adopt out, okay? In the Northeast, they don't have dogs. So we're shipping dogs from the South up to the Northeast, okay? Our transfers among shelters are just exploding, and there's nothing that's really regulating that yet. The ASPCA is coming in and trying to help do some regulations with their watershed transport, but effectively what we're doing is we're spreading disease, and one of those diseases is heartworm disease, okay? So if we look closer at 2016, there's some patterns that we can recognize from 2001, but one of those patterns is Right around the waterway in these warmer climates, anybody know what this is? Mississippi River. That's the Mississippi Delta, exactly. exactly. So what we know is about 150 miles off coast from Texas to New Jersey, we see our highest endemic areas, and then about 150 miles off of the Mississippi River, we're seeing our highest endemic um, areas, okay? Um, if you just went into one of these endemic areas and you gathered a population of mosquitoes, about 20% of those mosquitoes will have heartworm disease. Okay, spoiler, mosquitoes transmit heartworm, heartworm disease. 
Um, is there anything else you notice here in this map?
Now this is a very rare case, and what happened is um, there was a, um, people who had lung lesions that they were biopsied because they thought they were lung cancer, and it turned back that they, it turned out that they were granulomas secondary to a heartworm in those lungs. So, um, because Wikipedia is correct, we all know now that um, in very rare cases, humans can get heartworm disease too. I don't know if I believe that, but I mean, strange things happen in medicine, so certainly. I did not spend time to actually um, confirm that. So there are about 3,500 species of mosquitoes that we have identified in the world today. We are constantly finding new species. So this is an evolving number, but currently we have about 3,500 species in the world. There are 77 species that we have identified in the world that transmit heartworm disease, okay? 77 species of mosquitoes will transmit heartworm disease. In our country, we have 22 of those species that we have identified. Okey Now, again, another Wikipedia. So this is clearly accurate. Um, this is uh, basically a map that shows us, or a pictogram that shows um, 20, what, 24 mosquitoes, different types of mosquitoes. Now, based on my last slide, I said that 22 in this area or in our, our country are spreading disease. So if I were to hand this out to you and I say, okay, this summer when you have a mosquito land on you, don't kill the two that don't spread disease. <laughs> right? So my point is kill them all because we don't know. All right, do not let mosquitoes live. Kill them. The other interesting tidbit is that females are the only one that spread disease. So female mosquitoes are the only ones that take blood meals. So those are the ones that spread disease. So you need to know whether it's a male or a female that's landing on you, or whether it's one of those 22, okay? So I thought this was interesting, and I put this up here. This is just a random pick that I got off of, um, off of Google. And this is just six random species of mosquitoes. The Anopheles right here is what I learned in vet school to be the big offender. Those female mosquitoes are the ones that transmit disease. Um, you don't really hear that much anymore, that the Anopheles is the, the bad dude. Um, this guy right here, the Aedes albopictus, this is an uh, Asian tiger mosquito. And I'll point, I'm pointing him out for a reason. But let me tell you traditionally the way we thought of mosquitoes. So we used to think that mosquitoes only lived in the summer. We used to think mosquitoes only had a 30-day life cycle. There was no reason to get preventative over the winter because they can't do that. They're going to die because of the cold weather. Okay. And we used to think that they only fed at dusk and dawn. So the interesting thing about this picture is amongst these six, these guys feed at dusk and dawn. This guy feeds during the day. This guy feeds during the day. This one's late afternoon. This one's during the day and dusk and dawn. See what I'm getting at? It, dusk and dawn means nothing anymore. They're feeding all the time. The other thing is this guy right here, the Asian tiger mosquito, um, he can live up to three months. He can overwinter, okay? That's a bad dude. That guy's spreading disease in the winter. Okay. For mosquitoes to be able to spread disease, they do have to have a certain temperature and humidity. So if they have the little baby heartworms in them, and we'll get to that later, they have the little baby heartworms in them, and it starts to get too cold for the maturation in the mosquito, they just hibernate. When it warms back up, the maturation continues, and then they go spread disease. Okay. So the old thought of you can get by without giving preventative in the winter, that's a dirty lie. You need to give preventative in the winter because these guys can live in buildings that are kept at 80 degrees all winter long. All right? He has a three-month life cycle. If he gets in that building before it gets cold, he can be um, biting in the, you know, in the winter. Um, okay, so... The other interesting thing, and, and I really haven't thought about this until I started researching for this lecture, is the big cities, we've started this thing called ur urban climate. So with the big cities and all the asphalt and the people and the cars and everything that can absorb heat, we're making downtown cities hotter than rural areas, okay? So this guy, 
can live in an urban area over winter and be biting and spread disease. Okay? So the take home message for this is when you're talking to your adopters, it is not okay to stop preventative over the winter. Continue mm -hmm. to give that 30 day preventative over the winter. Okay? And you'll understand more as we continue down this, this path. The other thing that we need to keep uh, a really close eye on here on campus, as well as around your own homes, is all the sources in which mosquitoes can lay eggs. So any kind of standing water or slow moving water, a mosquito can lay their larvae. So if there's a, some bucket that's collecting water around, or a, food, or a bowl, or whatever, anything that can collect, can collect water on our campus, we're essentially creating a breeding ground for mosquitoes. So just be cognizant of that when you're out walking an animal or you see, dump, dump water out, don't, don't leave things around that can collect water. Any questions about this? Nope. Oh, this is so interesting. I love this slide because I think it really brings into perspective how infectious this disease is. And this is starting to be considered an infectious disease. Even though I can't come sneeze on you and give you heartworm disease, it is infectious. Um, in terms of it is very easily spread amongst dogs. So this study was done in 2013 by the Entomological Society of America. Entomology is the study of insects, um, which I think is super cool. I would have done that had I not gone to vet school, because um, I am nerdy. But uh, so, so some entomologists got together and they wanted to know more about how infectious heartworm disease is. So what they did is they took a heartworm positive dog and put it in a kennel. Now, I envision the same kennels that we have out in our holding. I don't know if that's the type of kennel or not, but that's how I have it in my brain. So we have a heartworm positive dog in that kennel. And both sides, on the other side of that heartworm positive dog, they put two heartworm negative dogs, okay? They put 100 mosquitoes that were naive to heartworm disease. So they did not have any baby heartworms in them. We'll get to that in just a second, but they were naive to the disease. They left those 100 mosquitoes in that heartworm positive dog's kennel for 24 hours. The next day at 24 hours, they collected all 100 mosquitoes. And what they found is 74% of the mosquitoes that were in the heartworm positive kennel had picked up the disease in that 24 hours. 30% of the mosquitoes in, that, in the kennels next, the heartworm negative dogs, 30% of those mosquitoes had picked up the disease in 24 hours. Highly infectious disease when you have heartworm positive animals. Okay? Any questions about that? It's kind of scary, right? And if we're not providing preventative every 30 days for these animals, they are susceptible to the disease. Again, I'm going to keep coming back to prevention because that's such an important part about educating your adopters. Got to keep them on prevention. Dr. Scott? Yeah. When you say every 30 days, so if somebody's like a day late, two days late, three days late, I mean, at what point is there a, or must you strictly follow the 30 days? Yeah, so um, I have a little bit of, of protected information, and if everybody agrees that they will not share this with the doctors, I will tell you. <laughs> All right. Do not share this with the doctors, because I don't want to give anybody an excuse to do something they shouldn't be doing. If you have been applying the FDA-approved preventative, which we'll go over here in a little bit, for every 30 days for a period of time, consistently, then you have two months you can miss and apply, and there'll be what we call a reach back, okay? That is not a license to not put on preventative, okay? But if you're missing a couple days, you're fine. Okay, so um, any other questions about that? That's a good question. Okay, I give my dog every four weeks, mm -hmm. so I could do like the first of the month and be okay. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. You're talking also like the pill, because I give my dog the uh -huh. pill. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. As long as it's a heartworm preventative. Yeah, yep, yep. Now, when you say one dog can transfer it to another, does it still have to be a mosquito bite or? Always, it has okay. to go through the mosquito first. Okay. Yep, okay. They are, there is not a direct transmission. It has to go through an intermediate host, okay? And we'll get there. That's when it starts getting complicated. <laughs> okay. Yeah, when you're talking about the heartworm positive dog creating all these now heart, uh, positive mosquitoes, when, when we're treating a dog and he's heartworm positive and he's on treatment, is he still, is he still creating Bad mosquitoes? For a period of time, yes. 
people, and that, oh, I'll get to that later. Um, there's, there's just a period of time where there's nothing we can do about it because the preventative doesn't work and the adult side doesn't work. But what we can do is immediately get them on preventative and do our best to eliminate that, that transmission time. Yeah, but unfortunately, yes. Yeah. Um, any other questions before I move on to development? No? Okay. So this, these are heartworms. This is a microscopic picture of heartworms. This is the male heartworm right here. This is the female heartworm right there. And what happens is they fall in love. <laughs> they make baby heartworms. Okay? I don't know, isn't it? It's the typical love story. <laughs> These are little, little tiny worms that are in the bloodstream. This is a picture of what, what it probably looks like to have those baby heartworms swimming through the bloodstream. So this is a vessel with red blood cells. The way we look for these, we call these microfilaria. That's a scientific terminology for the baby heartworms. I think baby heartworms are easier to say, but no microfilaria and baby heartworms are the same thing. So what we do is we take a little blood drop out of the vessel, put it on a slide, and then we put it under the microscope and we can see these little tiny worms wiggling around. These are red blood cells and white blood cells and then our little tiny worms, okay? So they're in the vessel swimming around. There are five stages of development of heartworm disease. Now guys, this is where it does start to get complicated and I, I know this stuff in and out. So if I skip something that doesn't make sense, stop me and have me explain it more, okay? The, the reality is it probably makes more sense to start explaining from here. I'm going to start at stage one because if you think about it, we can break our development up into five stages. We can have baby, we can have toddler, we can have juvenile, teenager, and adult. That's essentially what's happening right here. Okay? So, um, and you can see I have pictures down below. The larval stage one is in the dog. I'm a bulldog person, so that's, that's who this is infected right here. Larval stage one is only in the dog. Larval stage two is only in the mosquito. Larval stage three is mostly in the mosquito and in the dog for a couple days. Then they go to juvenile, which is lar larval stage four, only in the dog, and adult, only in the dog. Okay? We'll come back to this picture. <laughs> But it's going to take a minute. Okay. Okay. So bear with me. Bear with me. So larval stage one is those are the baby heartworms. That's mom and dad made babies. So to have larval stage one, we have adults in this dog. Okay. Who have made babies. So this dog has adults who has made babies. Make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So what happens at larval stage one is we have a super hungry female mosquito who zones in on the dog, and mosquitoes um, are, are attracted by carbon dioxide, if, if you didn't know that. So the exhalation, yeah, so when you exhale carbon dioxide or your cells exhale carbon dioxide, that's what's attracting the mosquitoes. So this, this, this lady's real hungry. She comes, sticks her proboscis into the blood cell, and picks up a blood meal. In that blood meal, she grabs a baby heartworm, okay? So remember, larval stage two is only in the mosquito. So now we have definitive host. This is intermediate host, okay? Some other intermediate hosts for parasites. Most parasites have to have an intermediate host, snails. Snails are a very common intermediate host for parasites, okay? Um, so what happens is she's picked up this blood meal. Those baby heartworms go to her gut. Magic happens. I don't really know what's happening in the mosquito, quite honestly. I don't know if that science has been figured out. That's not research that I've looked into, but something happens in the gut, magic. Um, and 10 to 14 days, at a minimum of 80 degrees Fahrenheit with 80% humidity, these larval stage one are maturing into larval stage two, okay? So they're going through that maturation process from baby to toddler, all right? At about 10 days, they migrate into the thoracic muscles. 
And then at four, about 14 days, they go into the salivary glands. And they're poised for transmission. I love that terminology. They're poised for transmission in the salivary glands. Okay? So about 10 to 14 days, if it's warm enough and it's humid enough, they will mature in the mosquito. So once we've reached the salivary glands, we are larval stage three. With me? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've picked up at one, we've matured into two, we're getting ready to transmit larval stage three. So what happens is, this mosquito, who was just doing all the maturation in the last slide, same mosquito, <laughs> I tracked him down and got the picture of him transmitting the <laughs> Oh, her, her. her. Yeah, thank you, thank you. You guys are listening. <laughs> All right, so what happens is, and I probably go into more detail, but again, I'm nerdy and I love this stuff. I think it's super interesting. So what happens is this mosquito has a proboscis. This is that stylet that I'm sure you guys all learned about in biology class. That actually has lips that come around it, okay? When the mosquito pierces the skin, the lips get pulled back in this 90 degree angle. So the stylet can be injected all the way through the skin. You follow me? Lips stay on the skin, stylet goes through, okay? So as, as the mosquito is taking its blood meal, it's drooling on the skin. And no lie, this is called hemolymph. It is mosquito drool, all right? In that drool, remember, those, those larval stage three are in the salivary glands. So as that mosquito is drooling on the skin of the animal, so are those larval stage three. They go down in that drool. They're hanging out in that puddle of drool. Well, when that mosquito pulls back its proboscis out of the skin, it leaves a little microscopic hole, and boom, gravity. All of those microfilaria dump down into the animal. Okay, That's how they get in. It isn't, they're not injected in, they get taken in with, with mosquito drool. Okay? This is a live picture of what, these are the little tiny microfilaria and the hemolymph. That's the stylet right there. See, that's cool, right? <laughs> yeah, there's a function to mosquito drool. Super small when you think about how little a mosquito is and that is its stylet and how tiny it is. Yeah, the, um, the larval stage four, so the juveniles can be about an inch to an inch and a half. The adults can be 10 to 12 inches long. Oh. These guys are millimeters. They're itty bitty. Okay. So back to this. Larval stage one in the dog. Larval stage two only in the mosquito. Larval stage three getting transmitted into the animal. Any questions about that? How many dogs can that one, once they spit it, are they out? That is a really good question. I don't know the answer to that. If you were one of my vet students, I'd say look it up and tell me tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, so you have homework. <laughs> yeah, I honestly, I don't know, but that's a really good question, and um, I'd love to know the answer of that, and at some point I will definitely look that up. Um, that's a good question. I don't know. My guess is probably more than one, um, but, but I don't know. Uh, so this is a slide that was um, taught to me when I was in vet school. Every vet student gets to see this. This is accessible to you guys as well. Um, this is on the American Heartworm Society's website. If you have not looked at that website, you need to look at that website. It is the best source of information for heartworm disease for layman's, for anybody up to veterinarians. So there's different portals in which you can go to to get information. If you are adopting out a heartworm positive dog, you need to be telling them to go to the American Heartworm Society. That is where they need to be doing the research, not gooddog.com or heartwormsalldaylong.com or whatever. You need to tell them to go to Heart American Heartworm Society. That is accurate information. That is where veterinarians also go to get their information. Okay, so um, when I got this in vet school and I knew I was going to get tested over it at the end of vet school, I just memorized. 
But quite honestly, I did not understand this chart. Okay, and I'm about to blow your minds. So we're gonna start up here. We have a heartworm positive dog. So this one has adult heartworms who have made babies, okay? So the mosquito's picking up that L1. So we're gonna come down here, picks up that L1, L2, and L3 all in the mosquito for 10 to 14 days. Okay, we've, we've gotten that, I've said that a couple times. So 10 to 14 days in the mosquito. When that mosquito transmits it back to the dog, we're at L3 for three to four days, okay? So we get in there and we're just immediately molting into our a juvenile stage, all right? So that's three to four days. The L4 stage, so that, um, that juvenile stage of L4, we're in that stage for 45 to 65 days. What we're doing when that happens is we've just, we've just followed the drool into the skin. Now we're trying to migrate through the tissues because really where we want to end up is the lungs, okay? So heartworm disease, the way that it's named is a misnomer. It is a lung disease far before it's a heartworm disease, okay? So what had happened is, you know, years and years and years ago when the first veterinarian did a necropsy on an animal that he didn't, he or she, didn't know why that animal died. <coughs> he opened up the animal, got into the heart, and there were worms in the heart. So, ah, I found a new disease. I'm gonna call it heartworms because that's where the worms are. In reality, worms are not in the heart until that disease is very, very progressed. That is the last place they go, okay? They actually start in the lungs. So these guys, the L3s to L4s, they're traveling between muscle fibers. They're in the sub-Q tissue. Their goal is to get to the lungs, to get to those pulmonary arteries. That's where they're trying to go. How do they know how to get there? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So they're trying to get to the bloodstream. Um, and I don't know how they know when they've gotten to the right spot that they say, okay, we're not going to travel anymore. I don't, I don't know that answer. Good question. I don't know. Warmth, maybe? What's that? Warmth? Potentially? Maybe? I'm not sure. Because what if they end up landing is the pulmonary arteries. And most of them are there by 120 days. That is kind of the last. They're, they're mostly there by 120 days. Is that right? Yeah, 120 days. So remember this, that this is causing damage in tissue. You don't just travel through tissue and nothing happens. That's causing inflammation in the body, especially in the lungs. Um, so we're, we're causing damage before we're even adults yet, okay? Once we get to the L4 stage, now we're developing into the adults, okay? And you can see that this takes four to five months in the L4 stage to get to the adults. We're hanging out in the pulmonary arteries. That's where we want to be. That's where we're maturing into the adults is in the pulmonary artery. These guys um, can live five to seven years, okay? So with no treatment, your adult heartworms are going to live five to seven years. Guess what they're doing when they're hanging out by the opposite sex? for five making to seven more years. More they're making more babies. They're making more babies. So even though one particular worm might die in seven years, how many times is it reproduced? Okay, this is not a self-limiting disease. All right, without treatment, it's lethal. Make sense? Those baby heartworms, those microfilaria, can live one to two years without treatment. So for one to two years, if we're not treating that animal, and let's just say all of the adult heartworms have died off. All we have is the microfilaria, the baby heartworms that the mosquito can come pick up to transmit disease. If we're not taking care of those babies, they're gonna live for one to two years spreading disease. Prevention, so how, how, prevention, how prevention. How the blood test the Excellent question. So right here we're transmitting. Right here we get a positive test. 
Wow. That's the mind-blowing part, right? Okay, so here's why. The test that we have developed, we, I have nothing to do with it. <laughs> the tests that have been developed are an ELISA test, an enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. I don't know what that means. That's not true, I do, but it's too hard to explain. So um, what we're doing is we're, we're doing a SNAP test. This is an ELISA test, okay? This SNAP test, we take a couple droplets of blood, we put it with a conjugate, so we, oh, oops, stop, stop, why? Okay, so we put it with a conjugate in this little tube, we titrate the amount of the blood and we titrate the amount of conjugate so we know we're having the right mixture. There's enzymes in that conjugate that link up to antigen, okay? That antigen is only produced by female adult partners. So, for us to test, I have to have a female that's sexually mature. Because that's the only thing that's producing the antigen that we can test. So we have heartworm disease six months before I ever know it's positive. That's why a dog can go home and have tested negative and then come back and have 100%. Yeah. That is why. And that super stinks, right? Trying to explain this to an owner, like, no, no, we didn't, we didn't do anything wrong. It's the way that our test is designed. The owners don't want to hear that. But that is honestly what's happening. We're not missing the disease. We don't have a test for it. The one test that we can do for this is the microfilaria. So taking a droplet of blood, putting it on a slide, under a microscope, looking for microfilaria. 20% of dogs that have heartworm disease don't have circulating microfilaria. And also, when you're getting one drop of blood out of how many liters, you may not pick up microfilaria. So that's not 100% either. But that is the, uh, the one other way that I might be able to catch those babies. But let's think about this, you guys. We had how many dogs come through Wayside last year? Uh, 3,000? I don't have the staff or the time to be able to take a droplet of blood put it on a slide, read it under a microscope. I, un unfortunately, we just don't have the time to add that test in. I would love to do it. It's best medicine. We will get there. Well, you make sure that happens. I mean, you almost have to, right? I mean, but, yeah. there you go. Okay, you're hired. <laughs> unfortunate part of development is there's no there's no great way 100% accurate way to test for heartworms this test that I just showed you about here this is 86% um, 86% accurate okay so we're gonna get false positives and false negatives on this test as well um, how do you I'll know that how do you know that the dogs have heartworm if you're not testing oh well I, I was just I was gonna skip that and get to it <laughs> later but I'm gonna tell you now so um, we do not rely on treating with one positive test, okay? Our treatment is arsenic derived. So we don't wanna just go pound an arsenic into every dog that we think has heartworm disease. So what we do is we take another sample of blood and we send it off to an outside laboratory to confirm. So every single one of our animals that's getting treated for heartworm disease has a confirmation test to tell us that it's positive. And we have both of those tests saying positive and then we start treatment. Okie dokie. So, does Wayside treat, I, I know Wayside treats if we know that they're heartworm positive before they're adopted, but those dogs that may be missed because of that six month maturation process, is it, do we treat them as well? Or do they go through that? Yeah, um, so, so currently we are not. I, that, that has changed a couple times um, since I've been here. So um, currently we are not. Now, if we've treated them and they've come up positive later on, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, we will retreat, okay? But if they've come here and we have a test that says negative and then they pop positive later on, unfortunately, we're not coming back to, to treat those. The other thing that can happen too that we see that we're seeing more and more often is heartworm disease is so expensive to treat, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, that some of these source shelters that aren't, um, aren't as, as blessed as we are, 
that can't afford the treatment are cutting corners. And that is a less effective way to treat. So what we have been doing in the back clinic, and this might change, I don't know what's gonna happen with this, but we have been noting in their file that the store shelter treated in a way that's not recommended by the American Heartworm Society, and if that animal is positive in six months to a year, they need to call that shelter. And we put the name and the number of that shelter in the notes. Okay, so again, that's how we've been dealing with it for the last year, and I don't know if that's gonna change. So the hard work preventative stuff, you're giving that during that first six months. That has no effect on? 100%. And it has tons of effect. We'll get there. Okay. Yeah. That is such an important piece of this. I, I've said it multiple times because I really want that to be the take home. And at the end of the lecture, which I hope isn't in six hours, but I tend to talk so much. But if you can <laughs> hang out till the end of the lecture, I'll cover that really well. Okay? Um, so um, when they take a heartworm positive dog home, they know it's heartworm positive. Do we still treat it? Or 100%. Do they have to their yep. Pets? Yep. So we do adopt out heartworm positive animals here. We provide treatment um, while they're in that home. So they bring them back to us to treat. Okay. Yep. Okay. So we do, we do offer that, which is honestly, it is a very, very nice. Um, that is a nice service that we provide our adopters. There, that's not, I wouldn't say that's commonplace in all shelters because heartworm disease is so expensive to treat. And that's when they're, they have the full-blown heartworm or when they, so like that person has another dog in the home, is that dog gonna be Well, if they're not putting preventative on that dog, 100%. But when they get adopted, you're gonna have a conversation with them about how important preventative is for all of their animals. Okay. Okay, so as long as they have those animals protected with preventative, they shouldn't get heartworm disease. Okay. Um, and then again, coil tail is male, long one is female, and we can only get the female antigen to do this test. Okay. That might help explain some of those cases that happen. I mean, typically I end up talking to them, but, um, but that might help explain some of those cases. I have a question. Um, so, like, um, so I adopted a heartworm dog from here and um, she finished her treatment in September mm -hmm. so like in March I'll get her retested and so they'll do I mean I guess my my vet will do a test mm -hmm. and will they do that snap test yep. then so are the chance I mean what are the chances that that test would come back negative but she still had heartworm oh, only because it missed it missed the female oh. Right, right, and, and that can happen. If there's a one sex infection, it can come back negative. Um, remember, there's an 86% accuracy on that test, so there is a chance that that test could come back negative and she'd be positive if, she, if all the females were killed off, which can happen. So, so when we treat, the first time we're killing about 50% of the heartworm, the adult heartworms, um, an 80, I can't remember exact, 81% or something, I can't remember the exact number, but 80-ish percent are females. That next treatment that we do, two and three, this back-to-back, -back, we're killing about 49% of the heartworms. So we aren't even in the adulticide or the treatment that we're doing, we don't necessarily kill all the worms, okay? So if all of those females have died off and there's still a male in there, it's gonna come back negative and your animal could still have a worm in there. That can happen. Do you, so after, and then do you recommend getting them, I mean, obviously I'm keeping the dog on preventative all the time. Um, do you recommend testing again after that six month period? I mean, it's another <coughs> six months or something, or? <coughs> Drink your water, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. um, so I would recommend if they were positive at six months, the old theory was, if they've been treated, you test at six months, if they're positive, you do all the treatment over. We don't do that anymore. And this is new stuff that's come out in the last six months to a year. The recommendation is that you retest at a year. So what we're finding at that six month test, and this, answer, this helps answer your question too, that antigen antibody complex that's happening in the body, so that female antigen that's produced by the sexually <coughs> mature adults, in some animals, it takes a long time for the body to metabolize that out, okay? Well, that test that you're gonna do, the SNAP test, doesn't differentiate between 
I just had a female produce this <coughs> antigen or this antigen is three months old. So it still could potentially be positive at six months without adult heartworms. So then we retest a year. If it's positive at a year, then you retreat. Now what I would tell you is keep your receipts. Keep all your preventative information because if they're positive in a year, you need to prove that you've kept them on prevention. We can call the makers of our adulticide and typically they'll pay for the treatment. Okay, because that's a failure of treatment. So they will reimburse for that. So if you do have a heartworm positive dog, tell your owners to keep that information because potentially they might be able to get some of the, that money back. If, if, if a rare case happens, and this is not this does not happen, I've seen it twice since I've been a vet, where, um, not three times now, where an animal's come back positive in a year and we've had to retreat. It's not commonplace, but it does happen. And if you can prove that you've been doing what you're supposed to be doing, you don't have to spend the money to treat. Or Wayside doesn't have to spend the money to treat. Um, going back to treatment real quick, I'm just going to cover this while we're talking about it. With that three process treatment that I was talking about, the first one we kill 50%, the second and third time we're killing about 48, 49. So that three treatment series that the American Heartworm Society recommends is gold standard for treatment, which we follow has a 98% kill rate for those adults. Okay, so we're almost killing them all. The two series treatment that people are doing down in the south that we're getting some of those animals that we're documenting in the chart that that's not a pro, you know, it's not following the protocol of American Heartworm Society. That two injection treatment kills about 90% of the worms. So it's fairly effective, it's pretty effective. But if they haven't killed all of the females and all of the males, and that animal goes home and doesn't get preventative, that we just perpetuated the disease. Okay, so the two injection heartworm treatment, in my opinion, is not an appropriate treatment. When you um, get sick with an infection and you uh, take your antibiotics, but you don't take all of them, and you kill off this, some of the weaker ones and the stronger ones are left behind, um, is that, and they can kind of create superbugs that way? So are the heartworms the same where they can kind of get resistant to the treatment? So not that, to my knowledge. That the ones that are left behind, you know, that the treatments don't work as well? Not to my knowledge. Arsenic is a very um, caustic um, type of, uh, of treatment. And I, I've never heard of resistance to the treatment. There's resistance now to the preventative, but not to the treatment. Okay? Um, and that we do add antibiotics onto the treatment, so I'm going to talk about that in a little bit and what that does. Um, I've said several times that they like to live in the pulmonary artery, so you all know this is a heart, right? Um, so these L4s and L5, they're chilling here. This is, this is where they're getting to. They love it right here. And what the purpose of this is, so the right ventricle is a very low pressure ventricle. This is not too scale. This guy, little bitty muscles around it. This guy, huge muscles around it. This guy's pumping blood to the body. This guy's pumping blood to the lungs, okay, to get oxygenated. So it doesn't have to be high pressure. Because it's pumping blood to the lungs, it's going through the pulmonary arteries where those adult worms live, all right? Pressure in this ventricle is zero to 25 millimeters of mercury. Mercury. Pressure in this ventricle is 120 millimeters of mercury to give you an idea of the difference of pressure, okay? Very low pressure system here. So if you think about it, <clears throat> what would happen if I said, I want everybody to sprint to the road and back? What's going to happen to your heart? <laughs> right? Like pressure of heart is beaten. Your blood pressure immediately goes up the minute you demand it to. Same thing happens with the dog. When it's going to chase a squirrel or it goes and runs around the bark park, or it sees somebody or another dog that's super excited, or it's really stressed. What happens when we get really stressed, right? Our blood pressure rises. Well, these guys that are hanging out in this space right here, they love it at zero to 25 milli millimeters of mercury. That is their pressure. When that pressure immediately shoots up, these worms can't hang out there anymore. They get shot into the lungs, okay? 
This is why we say four feet nailed to the ground. This is why activity restriction is so important in these dogs. Because once those worms get shot into the lungs, that vasculature in the lungs gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until we get into little tiny capillaries that are feeding the edge of the lungs. Well, the worms are bigger than the vasculature. So the worms get clogged up in the vasculature. Every single thing that that vessel was feeding, blood and oxygen, past that blockage dies because it doesn't have the circulation anymore. We call that an infarct, that dead tissue. When the, when the worm blocks that vessel, we call that a pulmonary thromboembolism. That's what they die of, and it is sudden death. Drop it, okay? This is why it is so very important to keep these animals activity restricted. Oops, 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 don't look. <laughs> okay, I hope I'm, I'm really driving that point home. It is a very, very important point of management in this disease is activity restriction. Now, let me be real honest with you. A dog, a heartworm positive dog can die in the middle of the night while it's sleeping. Okay, those worms can migrate, they can do things. Um, but we see a much higher propensity of sudden death with activity. Okie dokie. Any questions about that? It's really important. This is a, um, just a picture of how those heartworms are living. Now, this is a very progressed disease because the worms are down in the ventricle, okay? Now, this is a real heart with the worms up in the pulmonary artery and disease down in the ventricle. So, like, how many, are we talking like hundreds, <laughs> Yeah, so there have been hundreds found in dogs. There have been. Um, typically, a dog's worm burden, adult worm burden, is about five to seven. A cat's worm, worm burden is about one to two. Um, but one worm can kill the dog. The way that happens is you see these flaps right here? Those flaps are what closes and opens for the forward flow of blood, right? Well, a worm can wrap around one of these flaps and it no longer closes tight and when that ventricle pumps, those flaps don't close, blood starts going the wrong way, animal dies. So one worm has killed a dog, they have found that. Um, and I, gosh, I think, I could be telling you wrong, I think the highest number was 170. I could be wrong on that, but that's the number that's popping into my head. So lots and lots and lots of worms to very few can still, can still cause death. So clinical science, what do we see? What are your owners gonna see? How do you, how are you able to explain to them what to watch for when they're adopting a heartworm positive dog? My clinical science, you aren't gonna notice this. We aren't gonna notice this. We're gonna have a dog cough and it's gonna be on doxycycline for kennel cough. We're not gonna be like, you know what, we should think about heartworm. Well, plus we've tested. But owners are gonna think kennel cough, you know, they're not gonna go straight to heartworm. And typically mild disease is, they're really not symptomatic. <clears throat> Moderate, you're going to see cough, exercise, intolerance, and abnormal lung sounds. Remember, this is a lung disease first. So we may start noticing what's happening here, that the dog starts to cough a little bit more, doesn't want to run, because remember, those worms start to clock the forward flow of blood, so they don't get oxygenated tissue as well, so they're exercise intolerant. <clears throat> What also happens is those pulmonary arteries get distended because the worms are living in there and they get distended to the point where they start to put pressure on the main stem bronchi causing irritation to that main stem bronchi which can cause the cough. Okay, so we have a couple different things. There's inflammation that's happened in the lungs from the migration, so that can cause the cough. So a cough is really truly one of the first things that we're going to notice in terms of clinical signs. And the, the owners might notice some exercise intolerance. <laughs> when we start to get to severe, that dog is clearly having issues. And if we haven't tested it for heartworms, then that is absolutely the number one thing you need to do when you're hearing a cough, when they're having an exercise intolerance. If they fainted, syncope is fainting. If they fainted, for sure. <clears throat> Ascites. So what that is. Okay, this is probably not a good idea. Remember that dog that I showed you at the very beginning? Oh my gosh, okay. <laughs> so that 
dog with the big old distended abdomen? Oh, yeah. Remember that guy? Yeah. Okay, so what has happened in that guy? And this is, we're starting to get really severe when this has happened. His abdomen is filled with fluid. Okay, that is called ascites. What has happened is this is the uh, superior vena cava, this is the inferior vena cava. This one is coming from the abdomen, so it's coming from the liver, so it's bringing blood and lymph back from the abdomen, okay? This one's draining from the head down. That guy's bringing it back from, well, and you know what I mean. So those are dumping into the right atrium, and we're trying to get forward flow, but we're all clogged here because we have really severe disease. So we can't go forward blood, when I say we, we can't go forward, the blood can't go forward, so it starts to back up. And it starts to back up into the abdomen. And so all that fluid that should be going through the heart back out into the body is now collecting in the abdomen and around the heart. The heart's getting really enlarged at this point because it can't go forward. That is very severe disease. When you've reached the point of ascites, oh, there he is. When you reach this point, bad deal, okay, bad deal. And then Cavill syndrome, oop, oop, go back, go back, oop. Cavill syndrome is the last stage. That's that big, that big belly guy. I'm guessing he's probably Cavill syndrome. What Cavill syndrome means is those worms are in the heart, so they've gone to the ventricle because they can't get in the pulmonary arteries anymore, too blocked up, so they're hanging out in the ventricle. They're starting to back up into the atrium. This guy at Cavill syndrome has days to live. This is a medical emergency, okay? <clears throat> What happens in the hemoglobinemia and the hemoglobinuria? So um, when we have red blood cells and protein that are in the urine, and I'm not gonna go through the pathophysiology of this, but when we can test that in the urine in a Cavill syndrome animal, and it comes back positive, we have 24 hours to save that dog's life. If we don't get the worms mechanically out of the heart within 24 hours, that dog is dead, okay? So Cavill syndrome, medical emergency, you've got to get in there. Um, this is something that is terrifying to me as a practitioner, is doing this surgery. And every lecture I go to, they're like, oh, anybody can do this. It's super easy. Anybody can do this. No, it's terrifying. I've never done it. Um, I send these guys off to a cardiologist to have this done. And what you're doing is you're literally pulling the worms out of the heart, okay? So this is the jugular vein right here. This is the right jugular vein. We call it a cut down. So you cut the skin over the right jugular vein. You pull that jugular vein out with sutures. Anybody scared yet? <laughs> yeah. You isolate that vessel. You tie the vessel up to the top. So all the head that it was draining down into the heart, you tie that up to the top. So that, is a, that vessel doesn't work anymore. Okay, and it's okay because there's another one. So these, do these dogs really truly do fine without this muscle. So once you have the top tied off, or I guess in this picture the top tied off, you take an alligator forcep, you stick it down the vessel, into the right side of the heart, and you grab those heartworms, and you pull them out. You mechanically remove the worms in Cavill syndrome within 24 hours, or that dog is dead. But guess what? That dog is dead if you don't. So why not try this, right? Mm -hmm. Will we have permanent heart damage though? Permanent? They have permanent damage already okay. at this point, okay. yeah. In fact, um, even from the migration of the little guys, permanent damage. So we used to think we could cure this disease. Okay. There is damage that's lifelong. Can you okay. be 100% sure that you've gotten everyone out in this procedure? So you can do it by echocardiogram. You can watch to make sure, but um, there's no, unless you, there's really no great way to know that you have them all out. But at this point, you're just trying to get as many as you can. So here's some pictures, pulling them out. So this is the jugular vessel, or, or jugular vein right here. And this is a bundle of worms that have come out. This is beautiful. This isn't what it really looks like. This is what it looks like. Thank you. Um, I'm actually, I'm getting close, so we're good. Um, yeah, so this is terrifying. Um, fortunately, at Wayside, we've only had one of these animals that we had to send to Dr. Hatton at Blue Pearl to have these worms pulled out. Um, that dog did great, survived the surgery, and then um, bit the foster in the face two weeks later, and we had to euthanize. Oh. Exactly. 
that was a really sad situation. So this is this this is really sad. And and unfortunately we don't see a lot of it here because our animals are pretty well taken care of. But down in the south where there's a socioeconomic um, relationship to homeless animals and, and treatment of heartworm disease and prevention, lots of cattle syndrome down there. Any questions about this? Yeah, that's that's a sad, sad state of affairs. So treatment. This is um, this is our option for treatment. There's two different medications made by two companies. It's called melarsamine. This is the arsenic derived medication. Amidocide is made by Mariel. It kept going on back order, so we said nope. We're going with Daraban, which is made by Zoetis. Um, this is the exact same medication, exact same concentration, just made by two different um, manufacturers. So if you have some people that talk about amidocide or Daraban, same thing. Okay. This is an adulticide, meaning that when we give this medication, it's only killing the adults. It does nothing for the baby heartworms. This only kills the adults, okay? Now this is the American Heartworm Society's recommendation for treatment. We do follow this. We skip one step, um, and I'll explain that in a second, but, but we do skip one step. But this is what we recommend that everybody follow. This is what the South is not doing. Um, <clears throat> so what happens when we have day zero, we've tested positive for heartworms on our SNAP, we immediately send a blood sample out to the lab, we get a red collar on that animal, right, because that indicates heartworm disease, activity restriction, they get a sign on their kennel, and we start them on doxycycline. Okay, doxycycline. So here's another interesting part and complication to this disease. We don't know why but the adult heartworms have a bacteria in them called Wolbachia pipiens, okay? We don't know why they do well together, that synergistic relationship, we don't understand what it is yet, but we know that doxycycline kills the Wolbachia pipiens. In the old days, when we were getting higher concentrations of arsenic and not giving doxycycline, those dogs were having anaphylactic reaction to the treatment, having severe inflammatory response to the dead worms, and sometimes dying from the treatment. I mean, we used to say they might die from the treatment. What happened is somebody, some brilliant person, discovered that the doxycycline kills the Wolbachia, so that when we kill the adult heartworms, they're not releasing all of this bacteria into the body, creating an inflammatory cytokine storm, okay? What we're doing is we're effectively reducing the inflammatory response when we kill the adults because the bacteria isn't getting released. That's what the doxycycline is doing. <laughs> Questions? And crazy, right? Did you all expect this from this disease? Like, <laughs> right? It's crazy. So we do 30 days of doxycycline, so we effectively reduce that inflammatory response from killing the adults. That's day zero. Um, and day one. Oh, activity restriction, did I mention that? Okay, activity <laughs> restriction. Prevention, get that prevention on there. So I said that the adulticide is only killing the adults. The prevention is only killing the babies, okay? So we have to work together with our adopters to make sure that we're killing this disease. If they skip a prevention step, we're not killing the disease. If I skip an adulticide step, we're not killing the disease. So we have to work together to kill this disease. Day 30, they come in, and American Heartworm Society says on day 30, all they're getting is prevention. Uh, we skip that step. On day 30, we're starting with treatment one, okay? So on treatment one, they're getting their first do dose of melarsamine or that Daraban. They're getting steroids, so they're getting 30 days of steroids. That steroids does multiple things. So it reduces the inflammation from the injection site. You guys have seen these? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So heartworm treatment one, um, by convention in our industry, starts on the right side. We inject it into those deep muscles. They're called apaxials. They line our vertebral column. They're big, thick band muscles in our body. That's where the injection goes. I liken the injection to tetanus. I've never, I've never put this in my muscle but I expect that it probably hurts. Some of these large dogs are getting three to four mils of that adulticide-derived medication in that muscle. 
So ouch. ouch, ouch, yeah. So the steroids that we're giving not only helps reduce inflammation from that injection site, it reduces inflammation from the migration from the babies, and then it reduces inflammation from the dying off worms. Because we still have worms dying, even though they're not releasing all of the bacteria, they're still dying, dead foreign bodies, the objects in the body. Body doesn't love that. Side note. Um, so the last lecture I went to was by the American Heartworm Society's president. And he has been into heartworm disease for years and years and years, done lots of studies on his own. What he found is he had a 15-year-old dog that he treated for heartworm disease at one year old. That person remained on, or that dog remained on preventative for the 15 years of its life. They did annual treatment every year, so they knew that dog stayed negative. When he necropsied that dog because it died of old age, what he found were dead heartworms in the lungs that the body had granuloma around. Okay, so ju they just died, accordion styled up, created emboli in the lungs. That is a lifelong disease, you guys, because that blocked blood flow to the lungs. So again, we want to prevent, not treat, okay? Those dead worms were in that dog for 15 years. Wow. It is a lifelong disease. All right, so um, day 30, we give our first on the right, gets the steroid. We give tramadol, which is a pain reliever for three days afterwards. Again, that's a little modification, but I'm a softy, and um, I want to help with the pain. And then we tell them preventative, and they got three more months of feet on the ground, four feet on the ground, no activity. They come back at day 60 for injection number two. That happens on the left side. Day 61, we go back to the right side. So that's two injections, 24 hours apart. That happens at day 60 and 61. Again, they're gonna go on 30, 30 days of tapering steroids and they're gonna get their three days of tramadol. And at this point, you tell them prevention every month for the rest of their life. And they have feet nailed to the ground for two more months, okay? <clears throat> now people always ask, when, they, when can they get back to normal activity? So I say a minimum of four months. I tend to be more conservative because I don't want dogs suddenly dying on me. So I say four months, feet nailed to the ground from the day they get tested positive. And then at that point, my recommendation, and this is my personal feeling about this, is that they can get back to normal activity slowly over the next four to eight weeks. And the reason why I say that is because if you went and laid on your couch for four months, and then four months ends and the next day you go out and run two miles, how are you gonna feel, right? So you also have to work up your stamina, but dogs aren't smart enough to be like, no, I'm done. You know, they'll just, especially a Labrador, right? It's gonna go, 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 go. And so you have to regulate that activity for that animal. So taking into consideration, it takes our body time to work up to activity. Do the same thing for the dogs. Recommend that same thing as a slow, a slow progression to normal activity, just to be kinder to them. At six months after they tested positive and they've gone through all the treatment, at six months they'll get tested again at their primary veterinarian, okay? and prevention for the rest of their lives. Six months after they tested positive or six months after they were done with the treatment? After they were done with their treatment. Thank you for clarifying. Dr. Scott, mm -hmm. um, can you talk about, I, I hear, um, I think it's pediatric health per se, we have to, that part more positive they always have to come back and they have to stay overnight. Is that for all, well it sounds like for 60 and 61 they have to because uh, at day 30, they get the injection in the morning and they get to go home that evening. Okay. But it is also good to know that if we're going to see a reaction, that anaphylactic reaction typically happens after the first injection. So make sure that they know to keep a really close eye on that animal in the evening. And our technicians are having those conversations, but they only stay the night on that day 60 and 61. And quite frankly, it's really just for the ease of treatment for the ease of transportation. I mean, there's really no great medical reason other than just observation, but we're not doing that when they're here on day one, getting the most likely um, injection that could cause reaction. So it's really just for ease. Okay. Um, and if people are super opposed to it, we'll work with them. It's not something they have to do. So do those dead worms ever, I mean, do they stay? Or do they like poop them out or anything? Or? So they, so those worms, when they die off, they get pushed into the circulation into the lungs. 
And when there's something foreign in the body, the body's amazing, biology is amazing. So the body says, no, 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 I don't want you in my body. So it comes and puts like this protective barrier of tissue, we call it a granuloma, around that foreign object. So they go into the lungs, they get all squished up because they're dead, and then the body walls them off in a granuloma. So they stay the rest of them. Now, I don't know if all of them stay because we just don't have the science yet to go, you have 22 worms, we're gonna kill you, and now we're gonna follow you when you die, and well, we just can't do that yet. So I don't know if they all stay or not. When I was in vet school, we were taught that as soon as you start treating with the adulticide, those worms die, they fragment, the body reabsorbs them. Well, that was a dirty lie, okay? So here's news for you, things that I learned in vet school are not true now, and that's for your human medicine too. We're constantly learning and changing and, and evolving with information. So we know now that these worms are going into the lungs as adults dying, cordian up, granuloma around it, and they're there for life. Why do you shave them for the injection? It's usually like the vet yeah, so the reason why is because we want that to be as sterile as possible as we're injecting. We don't want to put bacteria in there too. Yeah, so what we do is we shave this area and then we take a chlorhexidine, which is a really strong antiseptic. So we take a 4% chlorhexidine, we scrub that area, then we clean it off with alcohol. We scrub it again with chlorhexidine, we clean it off with alcohol, we scrub it again with chlorhexidine, and we clean it off with alcohol. So if a bacteria survives it, it deserves to go around the world. <laughs> <laughs> That's a hard bacteria. So we just we just don't want to introduce right, any, anything. Right. I didn't have like, so people, so you knew they would be treated or? Um, I, we do use this as an indication sometimes. Right, of, that, I'm like, oh yeah, they got 30 Right, treated. yeah, but, so but no. It's, it's more for it's because we want to we want to keep them clean. Any questions about this before we move on? So numbers, what are we doing here at Wayside? So in 2017, we did 526 heartworm treatments, but remember each dog gets three. And unfortunately, we do have some people that come and get the first injection and never show back up. Those dogs have heartworms. Um, trust me, we're calling, we're being obnoxious, we're trying to get these people back in. So um, don't think that we're just like, oh, they didn't show up. No, no, we're obnoxious about it. Get in here, get in here. We have a certain amount of time. Get in here, get in here. Um, and I would say we're pretty successful. I mean, we have one or two that, that don't come back. But um, So that's why I have an approximate treatment of 175 dogs. In 2018, approximately 184 dogs treated for heartworm disease. Okay. So I wanted to know really, what does this cost our organization? And so Tracy, who's amazing, came up with this for me. Um, some some pretty, pretty cool estimates of what it costs. I would say the majority of our animals are somewhere in this range, the 50 pounder. Very few are the small dogs. They tend to be much larger dogs that are getting treated for heartworm disease. I don't know, a larger target, target for mosquitoes. I have no idea. but. Um, but it does tend to be the larger dogs. So to break this down and what it costs for treatment, now understand, this is just treatment. This does not count how much food they're eating, how much staff it takes to take care of them, <coughs> how many days they're spending in the, in the shelter. That none of those costs of service are included in this, okay? So if I take 184 dogs at 25 pounds, so all of them are 25 pounds getting treated. Just the treatment alone costs Wayside $25,000. If I take 184 dogs and I stick them in this 100 pounder, just for treatment, over $40,000 in treatment. $40,000 we're treating one disease, not counting in the cost of everything else, just the treatment. That is really, significant. When I say heartworm disease is expensive to treat, heartworm disease is expensive to treat. If you go to a 100-pound dog and you go to your primary veterinarian, you're not going to treat that dog for less than $800. It is really expensive. So, um, yeah, and if we hang out here in the middle, I think uh, my math was like 32, 34,000. So, and we have all the sizes. I just didn't want to get that detailed, but that's a significant cost to this organization. 
But the reality is, if we don't bring these animals in here, there's a large percentage of those animals that won't get treated. So it's important that we do this and we continue to do this. So do you know when they're being transferred in that they're positive or you don't know until they've been here? Sometimes. Sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes we know. Um, infectious, uh, heartworm disease is, um, like I said, now getting labeled as an infectious disease. For veterinarians to transfer animals across state line, every single animal that gets transferred across state line has seen a veterinarian within a certain amount of time. Mostly it's 10 days or less. And that veterinarian has looked at that animal and said there are no infectious diseases you can transport it across state line. Federal law says you cannot transport infectious disease across state line. The new regulations are telling us that we now have to start reporting heartworm disease as an infectious disease. So what source shelters are doing to get around that is they're not testing. Right. Otherwise they don't be stuck. Yeah. It's, it's a double-edged sword, right? Yeah. So, so the same thing with that might be. Yeah. Yeah. If they, if they, there's, test, there's, they won't test it across the state line because they can't. So if they test positive and start treatment, can they be transported across state line? So um, heartworm disease has not, um, they haven't said that you can't transport, you just have to document it on your paperwork okay. for transportation. So that's where we are right now, is documenting um, on our <laughs> paperwork. All 50 states, including Alaska, has heartworm disease now. Alaska doesn't stay warm enough long enough for it to be a transmittable disease up there, but we're transferring animals up there. Okay, so we have it in all 50 states now. And if they miss a treatment, say they go too far in between for the bring back, do you have to start back at square one? You do. And I would have to look up what those numbers are. I don't remember them off the top of my head, but there is a critical time period in which if they miss a treatment, you got to start all over. So if we get in They're available for adoption as soon as they've gone, made sure that we have everything else taken care of, we, we go ahead and adopt them out. Yeah, that heartworm disease is no way preventing them from getting adopted, okay? Um, I just have a few more slides left, so thank you for bearing with me. I know it's a lot of information. So prevention, I, I mentioned a minute ago that it is the prevention that kills the babies, okay? So there are four different type of medications that are FDA approved for microfilaria, uh, it's called microfilaria side, okay? These are the four different um, types of medication that are approved. We use Advantage Multi. I also use Advantage Multi on my own animals. So as a veterinarian, everybody asks, well, what do you use? Well, let me be really honest with you. They start giving me free product 20 years ago when I was a technician, and they have continued to give me free product as a technician, and then when I went to vet school and now as a veterinarian. So I use their product because I get it for free. I also really believe in it too. I wouldn't continue to use it for 20 years if I didn't believe in it. The reality is these topicals, when you're putting it on the back of the neck, it's the oils in the system and, and the body, excuse me, and the skin that is transferring that medication all over the body. This toe does not have as much medication on it as this spot right here. And so what they're finding out is that this doesn't necessarily have 100% coverage. Whereas the orals, where are the orals? The orals, since they're systemic, they have more of a, um, of a distribution that's, that's similar across the body. Does that make sense? I'm still gonna use this because they're still gonna give it to me. <laughs> but I mean, I really do love it. It's an effective, it's a highly effective medication also with Advantage Multi is that they get fleas, they get intestinal parasites, hookworms, roundworms, and whipworms, and ear mites and cats. Sentinel Spectrum, where's that? This is the one medication that has an additional coverage for tapeworms. So if I wasn't gonna use Multi, I'd go to Sentinel Spectrum. ProHeart here, that's an every six month injection. I've never used it, I don't recommend it, I don't know why, I just don't like it, I get that for free. So HeartGuard is just your heartworm prevention. So it's great for, it works great for prevention. You don't want to, ivermectins you don't use in collies. You don't use in your herding breed, your white footed, um, they're missing a receptor that, that it kills them. So um, ivermectin can, can kill your white footed breeds. 
So they say don't use them in collies and um, and shepherd, Australian shepherds and name some more herding breeds I can't think of right now. Aussies, yeah. dogs, cattle dogs. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, but ivermectin says, or heart guard says that there's not enough ivermectin in that medication to, to cause death. But I I'm just tend to be more of a cautious vet, and so I'm like, no, 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 I don't use that. Um, but heart guard's not going to get your parasites, your intestinal parasites, or your fleas, or anything like that, or your tapeworms, woodworms. This is just getting heartworms. So you have to use an additional product to get everything else. There is not one product that has everything. Mm -hmm. So you're always going to have to use an additional product to get your ticks, really, is what you're looking at when you're using these products. That's what mine are. Yeah. So in, Oral in Missouri in the winter, I switched over to, I, I use that in the summer and, well, nine months out of the year and the other one, but you recommend year-round basically covering all the uh, ticks, everything? I would. Um, I Yes, I would. Um, fleas can live in your house over the winter. Mm -hmm. sure. And also your intestinal parasites tend to want soil, but I would keep that medication on um, simply because hookworms, if you're not using a dewormer and you're just using the Advantage Multi, it takes five months of consecutive treatment to kill off the hookworms. So if you skip a couple months, your dog picks up hookworms, now we're waiting five months with that before we're killing off the hookworms. So there's so many benefits to using it just monthly mm -hmm. um, that I think it's important. Now, okay. if your dog hasn't had hookworms or anything, would it still be a good idea to use Advantage over? Guard? Not as you have to use what works best in your household. Mm -hmm. So if HeartGuard works best for you in your household, HeartGuard is just fine. You just have to add product on. Now you have to get a dewormer that you should be doing annually, mm -hmm. okay? And you have to get your flea and tick, okay? So there's just so much more additional that you have to do. I don't think it's a bad product at all. It's just you're going to end up spending more money and applying more product to your animal if you're just using HeartGuard. So that's why advantage. That's my preference. Okay. And I get it free. You have to have something to cover for ticks. Which is why I actually have used heart guard for years in addition to another medication to cover for flea and ticks. Because mm -hmm. we have ticks outside my house. Okay, so this is the last slide. One more thing I want to say about this, sorry. Um, lots and 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 lots of options, right? You can go to Walmart and you can get this. Okay? Some of those things, if you are not um, smart about what you're buying, or you don't know the product that's in there, you can kill a cat, okay? I've seen it a million times when I was on ER. It is sad. Um, that pet armor, that hearts, that crap you can buy at Walmart, don't do it, just don't. I, you might save money in the moment, but your animal could really potentially have a very serious lethal effect, uh, a reaction to that product. And also, it's not approved by the FDA. These are the only four medications that are approved by the FDA to kill baby heartworms. One, okay. qu one question on that. Uh -huh. Not that I would want to give an oral to cats, but is there an oral available for cats? Uh, not that I can think of right off the top of my head. Not that I want to try to give the pill when you can do the yeah. not, not that I can think of. Yeah. So there probably is. <coughs> Joe Blow, cat, yeah, exactly. oral, heartworm yeah. guy made it. Yeah, exactly. Um, so this is the last slide. And, and this is answers, I think, one of your questions. Um, so here's our timeline, 030 up to our adults. So right here, we're making antigen. We know we're positive, OK? But we have the potential to be um, growing into adults from this stage, right? We got injected here, and we're adults here. You guys see what I'm, yeah, okay. So at this point, I can give adulticide and kill the adults, mm -hmm. but I do nothing for the babies, okay? Down here, if I give preventative within 30 days of the injection, or the animal is on, if the animal is on preventative, this doesn't happen, okay? So if it's already on preventative, it doesn't get heartworms. If I start preventative, 
just a naive beginning of prevention. You guys understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I start it within 30 days of that L3 getting into the animal. That microfilaria side will kill that L3, L4. After 30 days, if I haven't started prevention, there's no way for that preventative, that microfilaria side, to kill the babies. So if you haven't done anything in that first 30 days, they're going to be adults. Okay? So we call this a susceptibility gap, meaning that there's nothing I can do in this time of maturation that's going to kill those worms. They are going to mature into adults. So again, prevention is so important to have it on before transmission, because then transmission doesn't happen. Or starting prevention as soon as you can, because if you catch it in that first 30 days, you're still gonna kill those baby heartworms. But only in that time. Nothing's killing the, the L1s. This is only the L3, L4. Nothing kills those L1s, okay? We have to prevent it. Any questions with that? No, but I do have a question on, on dosing, like that heartworm chew. I haven't done it, but what if you accidentally gave it two weeks after you already dosed the dog? Is there a danger in that? Yeah, um, so no, there is not. Um, you don't want to do that repeated, um, but we do, they're, they're fairly safe in the sense that, um, that you can use multiple products within a certain amount of time. So if we're going to switch products, we typically say give about a two week, um, or if you need to do tick on top of your Advantage Multi, because that's not going to cover ticks, so now you have something topical to add on for your tick, we typically say about two weeks apart. Now, if your dog goes and eats an entire package of Heart Guard, yeah. we need to deal with that. But, um, but typically, they're, they're fairly safe. Those products are fairly safe to use fairly close together. Okay? So, are you saying that, like, I give the first of every month, I give my dog, he takes a pill, and then he gets the stuff with the tick. So, I should be doing those about the same day? No, you probably, honestly, you're probably fine. Okay. Yeah, you're probably fine. But if you were going to go, okay, so I'm going to use Advantage Multi now, but I'm going to switch over to Vectra, which is also a topical, let's wait a couple weeks on that. Don't do a topical on top of a topical. Make sense? Okay. This is, this is kind of confusing, and sometimes we fall within the susceptibility gap and they come positive too. So this is another reason why we've tested negative and now they're going to come positive, but they've been getting prevention and it's because they started prevention and the susceptibility gap. So they're still testing negative, start a prevention after that 30 days, and then boom, they're popping positive. Um, this is the American Heartworm Society on day zero. It talks about activity restriction for the treatment, the gold standard treatment. Um, I'm sure I pulled this from something really important. I don't know what the source was for that, but, um, but I really want to, you know, to, to nail home prevention and activity restriction. Those are the things I want you to take away from this. Oh, cats. I like that. <laughs> 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 cats. Okay. So we're going to breeze through cats. I'm going to give you the, the high level. So cats are not the definitive host. Okay, That is not where heartworm want to take their dog heartworm. They don't want to take it to the cat, but the cat can get it. We don't test for um, heartworms in cats because it makes no difference. We can't treat cats. Okay, Amidicide or that adulticide kills cats. So you do not want to give that to them. That kills them. The only treatment for cat with heartworm disease is a slow kill. Add that preventative on and you kill those babies, but you can't do anything about the adults in cats. They have to die off on their own. They die off in about two to three years, okay? Cats tend to have an ability to kill the babies before they get to adults. So the cat's immune system can kill the babies. Um, we're not sure exactly how many can do that. <clears throat> What I can tell you is 20% of infected cats are going to die a horrible death. They're going to die a horrible death of heartworm-associated respiratory disease. Um, and as an ER vet, it presents just like asthma. So you have a cat that comes in open mouth breathing, respiratory distress. Your ER vet is not thinking heartworms because heartworms doesn't love, they don't love cats. So we start treating for, um, and I can say this because I was an ER vet, and now that I know so much about heartworm disease, I think back and I'm like, how many cats did I treat for asthma and it was actually heartworm disease? Because we don't typically treat, uh, test for cats. So they come in in respiratory distress, you treat them for asthma, and they die. 
um, I really wonder how many of those are heartworm associated respiratory disease. We can't treat cats for heartworm disease. 20% of them that are affected will die. There's nothing we can do about it. 80% of them are going to clear the infection. Um, the thing to know about cats that I find so important and that this is the takeaway for adoption counselors is cats need prevention. If you are not preventing this disease in cats, you are spreading the disease because mosquitoes are coming over and they're biting that cat and then they're going and biting the next animal that's naive. That cat is a sink for disease. All of your cats need prevention so you don't spread it. Make sense? This was for the vets. Um, at the last lecture, I put them on the spot and I told them to tell me which one was heartworm disease and which one was asthma. And each one of them picked a slide. Um, let me tell you, I wouldn't have known if I hadn't picked these either. I probably would have picked wrong. Um, the left here is heartworm disease and the right is asthma. So that was for them, putting them on the spot. All right, now we're finished. Okay. What questions do you guys have? Do you anticipate a time when we can treat cats? Definitely. I mean, at some point, if there's money in it, then yes, it yeah. will happen. Somebody will develop Somebody a way to do it. Out. Yeah. yeah. Somebody will develop a way to do it. So even if they're indoor cats, they should. Yep. The mosquitoes can live indoor. Yeah. Uh, cats need heartworm prevention. All right, you guys. Thanks for sticking it out with me. Appreciate it. I just said it was very well informed. Oh, yeah. I do love to talk. Oh, um, if you want to see what heartworms look like in a dog, these are heartworms that we pulled out of a, um, I, we pulled those out before I got to Wayside. Those go with me. Um, <laughs>